Hello and good evening. My name is Joshua Moore and I am a programmer for the Jewish Film Institute, the presenters of the San Francisco Jewish Film Festival, now in our 40th year. Welcome to tonight's digital event, Reconsidering the Catholic Church and the Holocaust, co-presented by the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. Tonight's discussion is an exciting, timely opportunity to highlight holy silence, a thought-provoking new documentary that examines the role of the Vatican and US leaders in shaping the Catholic Church's response to the rising Nazi threat and anti-Semitism spreading across Europe. The film's director, Stephen Pressman, is an alumni of the JFI Filmmaker in Residency Program. The residency program started in 2012 and supports independent filmmakers whose work explores Jewish identity and culture and is supported by the California Arts Council and the National Endowment for the Arts. I remember Steve very fondly as a resident and uh, our many conversations over coffee where we talked about holy silence and what would, how he was shaping it. And one thing was always very clear to me, and that was that Steve knew exactly what he wanted his film to be. So it was with, uh, it was with great uh, enthusiasm that I actually got to see this film develop in the residency and Steve completed his film during his residency. And I'm so happy that all of you are now able to watch it. Uh, so with that, I will welcome tonight's host, Suzanne Brown Fleming. Thank you. Thank you, Josh, and good evening, good evening, everybody. I'm the Director of International Academic Programs at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. The museum remains closed as much of the country and much of the world due to the coronavirus pandemic. But learning about the history of the Holocaust doesn't have to stop, so we're coming to you from our homes. We're grateful for your patience if we experience any technical glitches. This program will be recorded and will be available on the museum's YouTube channel. Our program offers closed captioning. If you would like to use this feature, you want to go to the bottom of your and bottom right hand corner of your screen. During tonight's show, please send us your questions through the Q&A function and we'll get to as many of them as we can. We're thrilled with the overwhelming interest for tonight's event. Tonight we'll show two clips from the documentary, Holy Silence. And if you haven't yet watched the film, it will still be available until this Saturday, the 22nd of August in the JFI screening room. And now I'm pleased to turn the topic to the topic of our conversation this evening. On March 2nd, the Vatican archives for the period of 1939 to 1958 opened only to close on March 6th due to the COVID outbreak. They reopened to researchers in early June with COVID-based limitations. These COVID limitations have meant that parts of the international research community have still been unable to travel to Rome where the archives are held. Our guests this evening are Peter Eisner, journalist and author of The Pope's Last Crusade, and Stephen Pressman, director and producer of this fine film and also of the Emmy nominated film, 50 Children. So Peter, I would like to start with you. Your book gives us a window into Pope Pius XI, who was Pope from 1922 to 1939. Tell us about him, talk to us about him. Well, he, he came to, to power um, at, a, at a relatively mild moment in, in European history after the end of, 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 of a world war. Um, but into the 1930s, he, began to, to find a, a, a push and a pull between protecting the church and making agreements with, with the likes of Benito Mussolini and eventually in 1933 with Adolf Hitler uh, to give the church an ability to, to, first of all, to make more money, but also to, to spread um, and protect uh, Catholic education in, in, in Europe. But on into the 1930s, he started to realize that uh, that Nazism and Hitler and anti-Semitism was a grave uh, threat to humanity, and and he began to react strongly, and and to to become a, a virulent opponent of of 
Hitler, who began to recognize him uh, into, the, into 1937, 1938, as, as perhaps his greatest enemy. But the rub was that the far more known Pope Pius XII at the time, uh, Eugenio Pacelli, was his secretary of state. And he was not of the same mind to be challenging uh, Hitler and Mussolini. Uh, it, it seemed too dangerous to him. So there was this push and pull between the two of them. Um, and with all of that, uh, Pope Pius XI uh, recruited um, a, uh, an American journalist, Jesuit journalist, John Lafarge, who um, became the third man uh, who uh, the Pope, Pope Pius XI, wanted to help him uh, pursue the, the battle against anti-Semitism, against Nazism, and against and against fascism in Italy. And that's really the crux of what of what of what the book is about. Thank you so much. Uh, I'd like to go to you, Steve. I want to talk about the timeliness of tonight's event. The wartime archives have an open, having opened this past March. How did that affect your film and how does this affect your film going forward? Uh, it's a good question, Susan. All the, all the time that I was working on this film, and this goes back a few years, it took me a couple of years to put this film together. I always knew as, as you and, and, and others who have worked in this field, we, we always knew that Pope Francis at any moment was going to give the green light to open up the archives. But I have to tell you that I panicked a little bit because um, a, a year before the archives opened, they opened, as you mentioned, in March of this year and, until they were shut down, uh, Pope Francis actually announced that they were going to be open a year earlier. And my film editor and I uh, here in San Francisco, uh, we were putting the film together when that announcement was made. And initially, I kind of panicked a little bit because I thought, oh, my, you know, my film's not even out and it's going to instantly be overtaken uh, by events. Uh, and then I realized uh, after talking to people like you and David Kurtzer and, and others who are in the film who have been working in this area for a long time that because we were talking about millions upon millions of pages of documents, it was going to literally take years uh, for, for historians and scholars to work their way through those archives. So at that, at that point, I kind of relaxed a little bit and it turns out, I think, uh, fortunately, uh, the film wound up uh, coming out at a, at a very opportune time because we're here talking about the opening of these archives and we're going to be talking about those archives for some years to come. And a lot of the topics that my film touches upon, um, I think are going to be as relevant years from now uh, as they are right now. So I, I ended up being kind of a, uh, uh, it, it, was a, it was a nice moment for this film to come out. I, I, I sort of caught a lucky break. Yeah, it's um. I, I, you mentioned millions of pages. The the number that the Vatican gives is sixteen million. And uh, from scholarly perspective, you're absolutely right that this is is not something we're going to find instant answers on. And and you hear a lot when discussing these archives the phrase unanswered questions, unanswered questions. And I want to go to Peter. Uh, Peter, for you, uh, whose research stops just before the war breaks out, what are the unanswered questions for you? Well, there, we do have a lot of circumstantial uh, answers to, to what was going on. Uh, th in the end, we saw when Pope Pius XI died on February 10th, 1939. And at that moment, by the way, the archives having to do with Pope Pius XII had not been available until, until March of this year. That's uh, 80 years. Um, so we had circumstantial evidence that showed a great um, change between what the uh, what the Vatican under Pope Pius XI was up to, and what Pope Pius XII, far more uh, better known, sometimes um, described as Hitler's Pope, um, is known known as that. Uh, in some writings. So we knew that there's a there's a, a big change. Uh, Pope Pius XI uh, was explicitly trying to battle Nazism. And for, for one reason or another, Pope Pius XII was muted for, uh, in, in many respects. So the unanswered questions is, 
when, why, how, and is, are there hot documents in this archive that will actually show us um, more than we know about, about why this change took place? Right, and, and I think the struggle has been uh, the, because we haven't had access to the details of that when, why, how, these kinds of polarized um, figure, pic images like Hitler's Pope on the one hand or a uh, defender of hundreds of thousands of Jews on the other have, have been the, the tone of the conversation. And, and one hope that we have is that when these archives are really come through, we'll be able to take a more nuanced look. And, and to that end, I wanna go to our first clip on Pope Pius XII. We're going to hear in this clip from Robert Ventresca, who's a scholar and author of the award-winning book, Soldier of Christ. I'm also proud to note that Dr. Ventresca is a member of the Museum's Committee on Ethics, Religion, and the Holocaust. We've just learned so much more about what was actually said, or not said, what was actually done or not done. And I hope that we can finally come away from these really simplistic caricatures, either that he's Hitler's Pope or he's a righteous Gentile. So it's important not to demonize him, but I think, you know, canonizing him literally or figuratively uh, is another matter as well. Steve, what does that clip bring up for you? You reported that clip in a beautiful uh, setting in a, in a church. And what was going through your mind when you were recording that clip? Well, I'll tell you, Suzanne, I, I... I, I had an objective from the very outset when I started working on this film. Um, and, and I say this in part, I have to admit, because um, I'm Jewish. Um, I, I, and I was, I was going to make a film that I knew was gonna be somewhat controversial in terms of, at least in terms of dealing with what has remained a, a very hot button topic all these years, the, the issue of the Vatican and the Holocaust. And above all else, I really was determined uh, to make a film that would not be seen as just a wholesale broadside attack on the Catholic Church. Uh, I, I, was, I was not going to win that debate, and I didn't want to be dismissed, as, particularly as a Jewish filmmaker, uh, to, to, to make a film like that. So um, I, I, I do think, and for those of you who have out there in the audience who have already seen this film, uh, it's, it's a pretty critical look at Pius XII, but I also wanted to make a film that was broader than just a look at Pius XII and what he did, what he did and what he didn't do. And that was, uh, that was exactly why I relied on folks like Peter, I, Peter who's with us this evening and, and the scholarship and the, and the book that he wrote about Pius XII's predecessor, because I knew that I had these cast of characters, Americans over here in the States, as well as people at the Vatican who were really kind of locked in a, in a struggle over how the Vatican was going to respond. So the film, I, I think, is much more than just um, was Pius XII a good guy or not, but ultimately, of course, uh, the debate all these years later continues to center on Pius XII, uh, whether, whether his silence uh, was a good thing or not a good thing, and, and the film certainly addresses those issues. Uh, and so this, the, the, the clip that you just showed of, of Robert, I think really nicely encapsulates uh, that ongoing debate uh, that continues to this day uh, over the legacy of Eugenio Pacelli uh, as, as Pope Pius XII. Well, thank you. And Peter, what about you? What does that clip bring up for you? Well, I, I think that, that um... The whole problem is to take a look at what was the Catholic Church doing at one of the most most cataclysmic moments in, in world history. Um, when I went into this project, I knew a lot about, as most people do, I knew a lot about Pope Pius XII, who, who was there uh, throughout World War II and and on into the 1950s. Um, and I knew very little about Pope Pius XI. And so when I started to find out that there was this this moment in, uh, in, in the Catholic Church that a, a liberal uh, movement was was attempting to to answer a moral cause uh, which Pope Pius XI was trying to do. So 
Um, the, the interesting thing for of, of all the time, and, and it goes back to the clip, is that uh, all the while that Pope Pius XI was trying to take the, the clarion call, a, a religious institution cannot stand idly by uh, in, a, in a moment, any institution can stand by in a moment of, of, of deep world crisis. Uh, all the while, there was another tendency going on in, in the Vatican, um, represented by his Secretary of State, Eugenio Pacelli, who eventually would become Pius XII, and uh, was interested in protecting the institution, and it seemed, and 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 doing things behind the scenes to stop uh, uh, Pope Pius XI, especially as Pope Pius XI became elderly and ill in the in the final years of his life. Um, to to uh, to launch this moral uh, uh, crusade. So so yes, the the archives uh, should be able to answer or should be able to direct us toward uh, more answers. Or without there being material in the archives that changes anything, we 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 maintain the context, which seems evident that there was a brusque change uh, in 1939 when this. Pope Pius XI died. And I, I think that you bring that, that, that change in Pius XI to the fore in, in your contribution to the film is really important. One thing that we did see when the archives for Pius XI opened from 1922 to 39 is Pius XI was a complex man himself. He, he also, uh, there was a real evolution in his own thinking. He, he really was quite conservative and, and lined up with Pacelli pretty well until this break at the end. And we don't know quite why that happened. So I'm really looking forward to learning more about that in the archives. And Steve, I'm gonna turn back to you. As a scholar, the filmmaking process is so fascinating for me. How did you research and, and make this movie? Tell us more about that. Um, at the risk of sounding like I sort of cheated, <laughs> The research was done by um, you and by Peter and by David Kurtzer uh, and others who are in the film. And I say that because all of you have uh, researched and written fabulous books on this topic. Uh, I, uh, I'm sitting uh, at my home in San Francisco, uh, staring up at a bookshelf filled with books about the topic of the Vatican and the Holocaust. Uh, and uh, the, the photograph you're looking at is me interviewing uh, Professor Ventresca uh, up at uh, up the college where he teaches in Canada. So for me, the research really involved uh, reading all of your wonderful books and then prevailing on you to sit in front of the camera uh, and talk about those wonderful books you wrote. Uh, so that was, that was part of it. But, but l let me just add briefly that I also wanted to make sure this film focused on some American officials who are not as well known all these years later and the role, usually the behind the scenes role that they were playing. So for instance, John Lafarge, the, the hero of, of Peter's fabulous book, uh, John Lafarge, the Jesuit priest for New England who was basically drafted by Pope Pius XI to to work with two other Jesuits in writing the, 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 the encyclical that unfortunately never came to be. Um, but there were others. Uh, President Roosevelt sent uh, his friend Myron Taylor to be his personal envoy uh, to, to the Vatican. Uh, one, of, one of the great pleasures for me in, in doing the research that I did was discover uh, Myron Taylor's assistant, a gentleman named Harold Titman, who was a longtime foreign service officer uh, who was actually living inside the Vatican, along with a couple of other Western diplomats uh, for a couple of years after the war broke out. Well, I had the great, great pleasure of being able to interview uh, Harold Titman's uh, now elderly son, Barclay Titman, who was a young boy who would visit, along with his brother, who would visit their dad inside the Vatican during the war. So for me as a filmmaker, it was all about uh, uh, taking advantage of the wonderful research that's already been done and finding hopefully interesting cinematic ways to tie all this, to tie all this together uh, in the film. And, and, and for me, that was, that was just the fun part of making this film. 
Well, I love the scene where Barclay Chitman is, is sitting with his brother and saying that for him, their entertainment was watching uh, the bombs fall. <laughs> it was really such a human touch. Um, let's... He, 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 I, I, because we're talking about a story that happened so many years ago, uh, I didn't really have too many direct personal connections uh, to this film. And as a result, I'm just so pleased uh, and delighted that I was able to include uh, Barclay uh, into the film talking about some of his personal recollections. Yeah, he was wonderful. Well, we're gonna take a look at another clip in the film in which I'm featured. When Steve first approached me for an interview, I talked about what this film brought up for me as a scholar, but actually also as a practicing Catholic who goes to church every Sunday. Uh, let's go ahead and see that clip. We all crave an honest, responsible, clear assessment of this history. For Jewish families trying to understand why, when they didn't deserve it, didn't do anything to earn the wrath of their neighbors and the Nazi regime and the silence of the church in the face of that. And for Catholics who are asking themselves, why did my church fail? Why did it fail the Jews? Why did it fail Catholic principles ultimately? Why did it fail to be a church of love and mercy? I want to go back to you for a minute, Peter. What, what struck me was that we have two men here, Pius XI and Pius XII, who wrestled with being both a head of state on the one hand and also head of billions of Catholics around the world on the other. And uh, frankly, we Catholics take our moral cue from the Pope. In your research, what was your sense of how each man dealt with this contradiction? Uh, I think that, that uh, that's where Pope Pius XII needs to be, we need to fill in exactly what we might know or what uh, or not know, because we, we could clearly see from Pope Pius XI in the encyclical that, that he put together that was supposed to be um, uh, uh, released in February of, of 1939 when he, find, when he died suddenly. Um, we, saw, we saw a man who, who wanted to fight uh, uh, racism. He wanted to, to, to fight moral depravity. Um, and, and he did that by uh, bringing in uh, John Lafarge, as Steve mentioned, Jesuit journalist, uh, a reporter for the magazine, later the editor of America magazine. Um, a, as a young man had, had worked in um, uh, suburban, uh, rural Maryland uh, in the early 1900s, um, teaching uh, majority African American uh, children and and as and, and parish of African American uh, folks in Southern Maryland, uh, in 1937 wrote a book called um, Interracial Justice, uh, which also, though a conservative man, as as the others that we're speaking about, uh, said that. The church must take the forefront in fighting the scourge of uh, racism in the United States. And his moral stance inspired Pope Pius XI, who was a, a great, who was a librarian, among other things, and a great reader, um, to, to translate that concept of, of racism in the United States toward um, the attack on, on Jews in, in Europe. Um, and he brought in, as the, as the story goes, uh, he brought eventually John Lafarge to his great surprise to uh, the, the Pope's summer palace at Castel Gandolfo and said, I want you to write this encyclical for me. Mm -hmm. and, and the encyclical will be, will be the, the essence of what you said. There's no such, there's no uh, difference in any human being. There's only one race and that's the human race. And we know all of this depth uh, from, uh, from, the, from the research that, that, that we've seen from John Lafarge and about Pope Pius XI. But we know very little about wo why Pope uh, Pius XII uh, veered away from this and, and blocked um, this. We, we, can, we can surmise, and we've heard little bits about him trying to protect and, and trying to, uh, to do what he could 
to pr protect the church. Um, but we don't, we, we don't know enough. So there's more, the more that would be seen. You know, I think my favorite uh, passage in your book was when uh, Father Lafarge writes back to his superior after getting this uh, directive from the Pope, the rock of St. Peter has fallen on my head. <laughs> it was quite, quite charming. Uh, I'd like to encourage the audience out there to go ahead and chat your questions in through the Q&A function. We're going to actually turn to you in just a few minutes because we want to make sure we leave an, at least half of the program for your questions. So uh, send them on in. And I'm just going to close with Steve. Uh, Steve, what are you hoping your audience take to, takes from this fine film? Well, you know, uh, along the lines of what we've been talking about for the last several minutes, one thing is I I'm hoping people will recognize that there were these um, relatively unknown figures. I mean, again, uh, we know that P Pius XII has sort of dominated the conversation about the Vatican and the show off for all these years. Um, and um, and, it, and it, was, it was delightful to be able to shine a spotlight as Peter does in his book and, and I'm able to do in the film on not only Pius XI, but somebody like John Lafarge. Um, uh, uh, I, I know that uh, when I've shown the film or when I've talked about this or talked about this issue, there's still a lot of people uh, in this country who uh, were not familiar at all uh, with, the with the character of John Lafarge. And so, so I'm hoping there's at least a, a little bit of, of that. But beyond that, I think the broader question and, and the, the sort of moral issue that, that the Vatican, the Catholic Church, and, and others have been grappling with for all these years um, has to do with the essentially the essence of what the film is called. It's called Holy Silence for a reason, because ultimately, I think the message of this film that I'm hoping people come away with is what is the cost of silence? And at what point is there an imperative, whether it's political leaders or religious or moral leaders to speak up uh, at various times in history? Uh, and and to me, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that audiences without without me hopefully preaching what that conclusion ought to be, mm -hmm. I'm hoping that audiences come away from this film wondering for themselves uh, about the obligations of both political and religious moral leaders uh, um, to, to speak up when, when, uh, when we have these moments in history that seemingly compel people to, to rise up and speak out. Yeah, it, it makes me think of, of two, two uh, things that the museum has on its own walls. One is what you do matters, and the other is ask why. And this film asks a lot of questions about why. And I love that and many things about it. Well, let's turn to you all out there and see what's on your mind. Let's see what your questions are. I'm gonna pull up my chat feature here and hope that I don't mess something up. Let's see, wonderful. I didn't so far. <laughs> uh, let me see. Um, okay. For Steve, uh, this is a question for you. What storylines did not make it into the film that you wish you could have included if you had had more time? Wow, that's a great question. <laughs> it is. <laughs> um, well, and not surprisingly, um, there were uh, there were two or three other. Again, I talked about my interest in making this a little bit of an American story. Um, when 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 I uh, put all this together and sat down with my uh, film editor uh, Richard Levine, um, there were two or three other uh, characters figures. Uh, in particular, one or two other um, uh, fairly high level. American clerics, Catholic clerics. Uh, one, jo uh, one of them was a fellow named Joseph Patrick Hurley, who was a longtime uh, Vatican diplomat. He was in the diplomatic corps uh, at, at a very high level, but he was also lobbying strenuously for an American perspective and uh, to try to convince, in particular, Pius XII uh, to take a strong stance in favor of the allies. He was an interesting character, and like a lot of things when you're putting a film together, uh, it's all about uh, the editing process and stripping away and, and sticking to the, 
the you know the main themes of the of the of the film. And unfortunately, uh, Father Hurley, Monsignor Hurley, uh, ended up on the on the virtual <laughs> cutting room floor. So one or one or two other folks like that who uh, had I been maybe making a multi-part series. <laughs> cram those in, but uh, unfortunately they, they fell by the wayside. Yeah. Uh, Peter, here, here is one for you. Um, you've, you've written about many things in your career. Uh, this audience member wants to know, why did you choose this project? Why did you choose this book? And also a great question. And my, my goal in writing has, has had, I've, as I, as I, as I self-analyze myself, Two things going on. One, one is um, always looking for for people that have to face a moral dilemma and how do they deal with that. Um, I wrote a book about a a, um, a young American pilot during World War II uh, who uh, who had to decide whether, after being shot down, uh, he would he would stay in hiding or he try to get back to fight. Um, and he did, and, and he went back to, to, to he escaped and went back to try to fight again. Um, I, I wrote, a, I've written about um, people kind of, kind of like a, a Hitchcock kind of feeling where you have, you have like an everyman who's not well known, but, but who finds themselves at a, at, at a, an important crossroads in, in, and they have to make a choice. Uh, and I, I find men and women like that, and that that attracts me. And when I found first Pope Pius XI, because so little, who's so little known, uh, and then I found John Lafarge, who who bas basically um, had been forgotten in, in at least in popular history, certainly well known and revered um, among Jesuits. And um, that's that's really it caught it caught the two strings and the two threads of my writing. One is moral stance, and one is a person that might might be not so well known, but deserves to be known for for having been very close to the moment and having taken a stance to stand up. Thank you. I've got a, a question for you, Steve. That uh, having three daughters in the house, I'm curious how you'll answer uh, the role of communism. Uh, for, for viewers today who saw your film, The Cold War is Long Over, and the, the real menace that communism posed across Europe at the time is hard to convey. Um, how did you handle that issue in your film and how much that influenced both, both popes? Uh, again, that's a, that's a terrific, uh, terrific question. And uh, in the course of a slightly more than an hour long film, uh, as opposed to a, say a 300 or 250 page book, it's a it's a difficult issue to address, and and the film really only makes a passing reference in the early in the early part of the film to how the issue of communism, uh, in terms of the early early twentieth century communism in Europe, how that really heavily influenced uh, Eugenio Pacelli, the man who becomes um, Pope Pius the twelfth. Um, he was a fervent anti-communist. He had been the Vatican's uh, ambassador, the, 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 the papal nuncio in post-World War I Germany, uh, when there was a strong ideological battle uh, uh, between right and left, between communists and, 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 and others in Germany. And, and Pacelli, throughout his, uh, throughout his career uh, in the Vatican, uh, saw the Catholic Church as being as needing to be a very strong bulwark against communism because communism was seen as this godless force that ultimately posed a, a, a grave threat to the Catholic Church. Um, and, um, and yeah, it's, it's hard all these years later to, to look at it in those sort of black and white terms, but, mm -hmm. but, uh, but, but that's how Pacelli saw it. And it influenced his views to the point that when uh, World War II comes along and Adolf Hitler rises to power and folks like Franklin Roosevelt are uh, trying to convince uh, Pius XII to take a strong stand in favor of the Allies. Uh, Pius looks around and, and sees that the United States and the Allies are 
uh, allied with the Soviet Union, uh, and it creates a real dilemma for Pius the Twelfth, and uh, and that probably explains to a certain extent uh, his uh, his desire to uh, to to remain neutral and never really to take a strong stand uh, in favor of the Allies. It's a, it's a it's a great question and. Uh, and I can only just touch on it in a film like mine, but it's, uh, it's, a, it's a complicated issue. Well, that is for sure. I have one for you, Peter, about uh, Father Lafarge, this, um, the hero in your book, as, as you referred to him, and what kind of relationship, if any, he had with Father Charles Coughlin. This is the uh, preacher, for those of you who haven't seen the whole film, and I, you still have two days, uh, who um, made huge, huge, uh, had radio audiences of tens of thousands of people and was um, unfortunately a rabid anti-Semite. Did the two of them ever meet, talk, have anything to do with one another? You know, I believe that they, they, they did not ever meet. Um, one has to realize one thing about Father Lafarge was um, there... Uh, they're working in New York as as a uh, journalist in the 30s after having been in a far off parish in southern uh, Maryland. Um, they did not meet, um, and there there were some references um, to to um, Father Lafarge. Again, as as you said very well, Suzanne. These were very conservative people, and 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 the issues they were facing were, were very complex. Um, I think that uh, he and many other priests were were afraid of speaking against Father Coughlin because he because his his reach nationwide was was so huge mm -hmm. um, and so the, the, you know simplistically it just it sold Catholicism. Um, uh, to to a, a wider audience, uh, which is which is what they were seeking. Uh, um, um, but of course, Father Coughlin, when we came, uh, he Father Coughlin eventually broke with Franklin Roosevelt. Felt that he'd been sh um, had had been um, uh, disregarded by by Roosevelt. Moved increasingly right wing, increasingly virulently anti-Semitic, and. Um, uh, even then, um, it, it wasn't exactly uh, Lafarge's, he wasn't in a moment to be writing about this. And there's certainly people in the church uh, that were challenging uh, uh, Father, Father Coughlin, such as, as, as uh, Monsignor Hurley, who, uh, who Steve just mentioned. But, but uh, Father Lafarge um, was in the crowd of, of, of being afraid of the power that, that Father Coughlin had. Thank you. I have one for you, um, Steve, and it's about the, uh, the part of your film where you interview uh, this, this wonderful Italian nun and also a granddaughter of uh, a family where one of her grandparents survived and the other was murdered in Auschwitz and this, uh, this this really, for me, added a lot to the film. How did you How did you find these characters to interview for your movie? Uh, uh, in the case of Sister Pascalizzi, uh, who is the mother superior of a tiny little convent that, oddly enough, is part of a luxury hotel, um, a, a few hundred yards from the Vatican. I mean, you you could you couldn't make this stuff up. Mm -hmm. um, that was that was a total accident. Uh, that Sister Pascalizzi ended up in the film, uh, and, and I'll be as brief as I can in, in explaining how I, I, I got to her. Uh, we, were, uh, we were actually uh, there at the, at the convent. There's, there's this gorgeous 500-year-old uh, chapel uh, that's attached to this luxury hotel, and we were actually there to interview somebody else, uh, an, an academic uh, who, uh, I hate to say it, is actually not even in the film. Um, and while uh, my cameraman and I were setting up and we had the permission from, uh, from the Mother Superior to film there at the convent in the, in the chapel, she did not speak a word of English and I don't speak any Italian, but my cameraman and his assistant were explaining to Sister Pascalizzi uh, what we were doing and what the film was about. And her face lit up. She said, uh, 
uh, in Italian. She said, oh my God, um, uh, my predecessors during the war hid Jews right here in this convent. And, um, and at that point, uh, we turned around while we were waiting for uh, the man who we were there to interview. And we, we asked her if she would be willing to just uh, sit in front of the camera and tell us the story. Um, and that's how it happened. And uh, it was, um, there's an expression in the filmmaking world to, to find gold. And, and that was a great, great, a, a great example of finding gold. So I, I, I was asking her these questions in English. Uh, our, my production assistant was, was translating and, and the good sister was answering in Italian. Uh, I didn't understand a word of, you know, basically a word of what she was saying. And I didn't even know exactly what she told me until I brought the interview back to the States and had it translated. And that's when I knew I had really, really uh, great material for, uh, for the film. Uh, and, and just very quickly, uh, Michela Pavoncello, the, the granddaughter and, and actually the, also the great granddaughter of a Holocaust victim uh, is a wonderful woman in Rome who leads tours of the Jewish ghetto mm -hmm. in Rome. Uh, and and I, I, I knew of her and I knew that she was very steeped in, in this history and she was uh, really enthusiastic about uh, opening up uh, her thoughts about, uh, she, she's got a pretty critical take on the, on the Catholic Church. Uh, and, uh, and so she's in the film as well. So th those were two wonderful, wonderful interviews for the film. Yeah, uh, uh, my, my grandfather didn't get this invitation. Uh, <laughs> she was quite pointed. I'm gonna stay with you for one minute, actually, because this next question I'm curious about myself, I must say. Have you gotten any response uh, from church officials or uh, Catholics to your film? Um, and, and actually, Peter, the, the same to you on your book, but maybe we'll start with Steve. Sure. Uh, you know, nothing, nothing official. Um, you know, as you know, Suzanne, uh, one of the one of the people in the film, uh, father, a, a gentleman you know quite well, Father uh, Norbert Hoffman, who uh, is a senior official at the Vatican. He is the head of the Pope's Commission for Jewish Relations, basically, and he very graciously and generously agreed to sit down for an interview uh, in the film. He's He's, a, he's essentially a defender of Pius XII, and I wanted that view in the film. Um, before the before COVID shut things down, uh, we had the opportunity to to show the film uh, among other places, St. Joe's University uh, in Philadelphia, and and so we've been able to have a discussion uh, with some Catholic audiences and and, and Catholic panelists. Uh, and, uh, you know, most of those folks have been pretty open-minded about it. Um, I, uh, I, I would love to, at some point, be able to share this film with folks at the Vatican uh, uh, back in Rome. And I, and I hope when the world reopens, we might have that opportunity, because I, I would be eager to hear what they think about this, uh, this, this film as well. Yeah. Peter, what about you? What kind of response did you get to your book when it came out? Well, I, I was honored to be asked uh, to speak at uh, at a at a forum at America Magazine uh, when I when I wrote the book mm. and uh, they interviewed me for, for the magazine and they they named the book uh, their book of the month. Wow! As a matter of fact, and uh, and, um, and the, the the contact that I had uh, with the Jesuits was fabulous. Um, that that's one thing. The other thing I'd mentioned among many. Is that, as far as I know, there's there, there are many there are many churches uh, there are many uh, religious schools <clears throat> excuse me religious schools in the United States named after various popes Pope Pius VI uh, Pope Paul VI uh, Pope Pius XII as far as I know there's one high school in the United States um, happens to be in in Wisconsin in Milwaukee that's um, named after Pope Pius XI, they asked me to come talk about them, oh, wow. which I did, and I, I was delighted. And, um, and I told, told, talked about John Lafarge, and I talked about how the Pope died the day before he was about to launch his, his moral attack against Hitler and uh, Mussolini. And uh, afterwards, somebody came up to me and, and asked me, um, 
why does God let things like that happen? Wow. And wow. And um, I thought about <laughs> that, and the only <laughs> thing I could say was yes. Um, but it, but it was very poignant, and and the response has been very thoughtful, and and uh, and uh, across the board, and I, I I was I was touched by that. Well, this this question from an audience member uh, relates, and I'm again gonna ask this to both of you. Uh, you both mentioned that um, you are Jewish, and I have mentioned that I'm Catholic. So maybe a slightly personal answer to this would would be in order. And we'll, we'll start with you, Steve. How do you think this history affects Catholic Jewish relations today? Oh, my. <laughs> I'm not quite sure I'm, I'm in a position, to be honest, uh, to really answer that. I, I, uh, I'm i Jewish. I made this film about the Catholic Church, and that pretty much sums up my interaction with, with Catholics. Some of my best friends are Catholics. Don't I count? <laughs> Boy, you know, I mean, I, I will say this, as you know, Suzanne and, and, and others, both at the Holocaust Museum and elsewhere, this has been um, both an opportunity and a challenge for decades now in terms of Catholic Jewish relations. Mm -hmm. Sore point, for many years, there was talk of turning Pius XII into a saint, and that created some controversy in terms of Catholic Jewish relations. That, 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 that discussion has, has died down at this point. The, the issue of sainthood for Pius XII has pretty much subsided. But you know, with the archives opening, I, I think the only thing we can say for sure is that this, this is going to remain a controversial issue. And as long as that's the case, there's going to be some ongoing issues, some points of contention in terms of, I, I think, in terms of Jewish Catholic dialogue uh, for some time to come. And, and that's the best I can say about that. Most I can say about that. How about you, Peter? Well, um, I think that w one thing I can say is that, that, of course, there's no monolith of a Jewish community and there's no monolith of a, of a, of a Catholic community. Right. So Very important. there's, different, there's ver very different nuances of how people will, will see this. I mean, I, one response I did get to the book was somebody it reminded me of like almost like uh, an old SNL uh, Saturday Night Live uh, joke. Somebody somebody said, I'm not going to bother reading this book because here's somebody that's writing badly of Pope Pius XII. And, um, and of course, I was not writing about Pope Pius XII. I was writing about Pope Pius XI. And I wanted to answer the person so that they would say, never mind. Mm -hmm. uh, but as far as as far as 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 my connection to to talking to uh, religious people, re well, rabbis and and priests, for instance, and uh, in the course of doing this work, I think there's a there's a great sense of 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 shedding light and oxygen on this subject mm -hmm. um, is, is is the way to go. So let let the I, and I think you said it uh, very well, uh, Suzanne, that it, re really what we want to do is w when things went wrong, why did they go wrong? And what answers can we have for ourselves in terms of where we come from and in terms of where we go in the future? And I think that in general, I would say that that's where most the majority of, of my contact has been both among Jews and Catholics and looking at the story. Yeah, my own sense is that there's so much willingness on, on both sides to have a real dialogue, to look at this material in an honest, uh, responsible way, to take our time before drawing quick conclusions and really do the hard work for these decades. Uh, there was another question in the chat about whether uh, you think that archive, pieces of the archives were held back uh, or are they all really available? And I'll just answer that quickly. I think it would be very hard to hide everything in 16 million pages. Uh, so I think historians, I don't think there's been any kind of purging. And I think that what, uh, from all the signals that, that I have had in, in talking to officials at the Vatican, they, they want the same thing that we want, a, a responsible, clear, careful 
working through these documents and seeing what we find. I'm going to ask um, one, one more question, which is a fun one um, to both of you. Steve, do you plan to make a sequel as, as the archives uh, become unroll and, and we start to get access to some of the unanswered questions? That's an easy one. No. <laughs> 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 and Peter, are you gonna are you gonna write a part two to your book and the story of what happened after uh, Pius XI died and the encyclical was shelved? Well, there there are some there's two parts to it. One is that I was inspired by by these issues in, in the course of, of my investigation, and there are lots of un unanswered questions. Um, I mentioned in, in the book. Um, questions surrounding the death of Pope Pius XI. And, and there, are, there are little stories about that. And, and there's, there is some mi missing documentation. Um, the, the beloved uh, Cardinal Tisserand, uh, uh, who was very close to Pope Pius XI, uh, had written about uh, this whole period and, 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 and the change from Pope Pius XI to Pope Pius XII. And his... Um, his memoirs, uh, he, he died um, at a moment in which, which they weren't complete and they, were, and they were at his home, as I recall, and they were taken away and nobody's seen them since. Uh, nobody know, knows exactly where they are. And I, I've, once in a while I've thought about, uh, uh, Cardinal Tisserand was, was in the, at the Vatican the day that, that Pope Pius XI died. And, and, lived a nice long life and was close in the Vatican and lived, lived on into the 60s. Um, and, um, and is an interesting person. I've thought about looking more at where are those archives and, mm. and what more can be said about him. So if I were to do anything, it would be that. But I've taken this as, as, as also to just move on and take a look at, at the issues surrounding World War II and surrounding the questions that, that were raised for me about this. So one way or another, I'll be looking at a at, 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 at tangential story. Well, we're all gratified to hear that. Um, if we didn't get to your question, I'm so sorry. Um, we are so grateful to have had everybody with us. And I'm going to ask that my colleague, Dr. Rebecca Carter Chand close our program and, and good night, everybody. Thank you for joining us for tonight's program. With the Vatican archives for the 1939 to 1958 period opening, so many questions await rigorous scholarly analysis and none of us expect quick answers. It will take uh, years and many scholars to carefully examine this material. And the museum is excited to lead some of these efforts. The museum's programs on ethics, religion, and the Holocaust has been an integral part of the USHMM since its founding. We foster scholarship, teaching, and reflection on the profound ethical, theological, and historical questions raised by the Holocaust. We work with scholars, religious leaders, interreligious groups, and people of all faiths uh, who are interested in the history of the church's response to the Holocaust and the ways in which religious institutions, leaders and theologians have responded to this history since 1945. So through discussions like the one that we've had tonight with filmmakers, journalists, historians, we are able to highlight the latest research and learn more about Holocaust history and the role of the Catholic church during this period. To that end, I would like to thank our co-presenters, the Jewish Film Institute, and we hope that you will have an opportunity to join a future JFI program. We also hope that you will join us for future digital events, such as the museum's Facebook Live series. The next program will be held this coming Wednesday, August 26th at 9.30 a.m. Eastern Time on the museum's Facebook page. You don't have to have a Facebook account to watch and the program will remain on the page after it is live. Thank you and have a great evening.